Thank you. So, Leonard Kundli and I, we will now present our paper, Factors of Literary History, which we wrote together with Fotis Janidis and Simone Winko. Our paper focuses on how to model various complex relationships associated with literary change, but before we really get into that, we'd like to take a step back and to briefly tell you something about the more general project from which this talk has emerged. So we are part of a project that's called The Beginnings of Modern Poetry. The project team consists of the people I already mentioned. We are based in Germany and started in 2020. And we are part of a priority program funded by the German Research Foundation that's called Computational Literary Studies, which brings together multiple German language, the age projects, uh, some of which have already uh, participated in this conference. Now, our project focuses on German language poetry from about 1850 to 1920. We analyze literary change and various characteristics of the poems, for example, genre, emotion, but also um, a lot more. And obviously, we use quantitative computational methods. Okay, but now let's get back to the real topic of this talk, which is factors of literary history. Broadly speaking, we have two main questions. To what extent is a given literary phenomenon related to various other factors, both internal and external to the text, and how can we find out? We investigate a specific case, the representation of emotion in German language poetry from about 1850 to 1920, and we include factors such as the literary period or genre. For example, we'd like to find out whether poems from literary period A represent different emotions than poems from literary period B, and furthermore, whether the connection between emotion and period is stronger or weaker than the connection between emotion and, let's say, genre. And period and genre are just two examples of the many more factors we take into account. We focus on emotion partly because our project has already collected data on this phenomenon in previous studies, and partly because emotion is quite important to the history of German language poetry according to research. Now, why do we think that the questions on the slide are important? One reason is that there's no consensus between literary scholars what kind of features, are, especially text external features, are related to literature and literary change, um, what these features are, and how to weigh them against each other. And at least to our knowledge, there's no well-established method that solves these issues on a broad empirical and computational basis, taking into account, and that's important, that multiple factors might play a role at the same time, and that these factors might also influence each other. We try to address these, these issues, noting that this is one of our very first attempts, so the discussion is very welcome. I'll now give a brief overview over our corpus and our resources, and then Leo continues with our methods, our results, and a discussion. Okay, so our corpus consists of texts in 22 anthologies from the period under study with then contemporary German language poetry. And it is possible to divide the anthologies and thereby our corpus into three different parts along different literary periods, and this division into periods will become important later on. So we have eight anthologies with more than 3,000 poems from the literary period of realism. That means, in our case, the 1850s until the early 1880s. We have 12 anthologies with slightly less than 3,000 poems from modernism. That is, in our case, the time around 1900. And then there are two anthologies from expressionism with 370 poems that were published in the 1910s. Okay, as said, we are interested in how different factors are related to emotion. So in the first step, we have to find out what kind of emotions the poems represent. And it's important to note that we focus on emotions represented by the text itself. So we are interested in, for example, whether a character or the speaker of the poem is happy. We are not interested in emotions of readers. We assign uh, six main um, emotions to lines of the poem, agitation, anger, fear, love, joy, and sadness. So we are using a discrete emotion model. And we annotated more than 1,300 poems of our corpus 
manually achieving a gamma agreement of uh, 0.75. And it's important to note that for um, the remainder of this talk, we only use these manually annotated poems. So all further analysis rely exclusively on manual annotations. Okay, here you can see the distribution of the annotated emotions and clearly we annotated sadness, love and joy most often and agitation, fear and anger a lot uh, less often. But obviously this distribution varies greatly by poem. There are some poems that only represent this emotion, some poems that only represent that emotion, some poems that represent no emotions uh, at all, and so on. And probably there are some factors involved um, when it comes to what kind of emotions are represented. And we want to investigate some of these factors in our study. This is the list of factors we take into account. So first of all, we want to know whether there is a connection between emotion on the one hand and the literary period on the other hand, in our case, realism, modernism, expressionism. Another factor we include is author gender, and this factor is limited in our study to two options, male and female. We certainly recognize that there are more possible gender positions than just these two, but unfortunately, the uh, historical resources we had to use to identify author gender, they only mention either male or female authors. Then we also include thematic genre and non-thematic genre as two more possible factors that might be related to emotion. Thematic genre means something like love poetry, nature poetry, historical poetry, and so on. And non-thematic genre refers to other genre cat categories such as ballad, sonnet, or song. And we annotated um, genre manually for all the poems that had already been annotated for emotion. And the last factor we use is the experiencing entity. That means the entity, in our case, the speaker of the poem or a character or an object that is said to feel or experience the emotion. And we also manually annotated entity for every emotion annotation. Okay, so this is our list of factors, but how did we come up with this list? Obviously, it is possible that the representation of emotion is influenced by dozens or even hundreds of factors, no one knows, but for pragmatic reasons alone, we had to limit ourselves to a selection, and um, we chose these features partly because there was appropriate data available for all of them, that's obviously a necessary condition, but um, partly as well because previous studies have indicated that these features might at least be related to emotion. But we are still very interested in discussing our feature selection, so if you have any ideas for further features we might uh, consider, that might be very interesting. Okay, these were our resources, and now Leo will continue with our methods. Well, thank you, Merten. Um so here you see the emotion distribution again, this time um, grouped by literary periods. And the um, question we try to answer is, is um, what we see here actually due to um, the uh, properties of these periods or are there some hidden um, other factors that produce this distribution? And this set up to the path of this uh, study I will present to you now. So the first thing we tried was to um, yeah, use a basic logistic regression, a Bayesian style, and to yeah, give it uh, all the factors and fit it and try to predict the emotion of the poems. Afterwards, we um, sampled the slope values from the posterior predictive distribution and um, yeah, you see the results here. Um, the most impact had the experiencing entity followed by both of the genres and yeah, period and gender seem to be a bit less informative here. So the question <laughs> I want to ask now is, can we trust our results here? And the answer to this is, um, yeah, we shouldn't because our results only hold if those assumptions are true. And um, yeah, I think it's not a bold statement to assume that literary genres um, yeah, evolve with literary periods and that they have some kind of interactions. So we 
kind of can't use these the uh, basic logistic regression and through everything added, we have to um, yeah try something more sophisticated. And fortunately, you um, don't have to rely <laughs> on my uh, statement about it because we uh, looked into it in another paper and uh, showed that there is um, an interaction between genre and um, literary period. For example, here you see the profiles in emotions of love poems and religious poems. And in the love poems, there is a decrease of the emotion love in modernism and in religious poems, um, yeah, the frequency of love is higher in modernism. So they kind of <laughs> cross here. So, so how do we <laughs> deal with this knowledge? The first thing we did was to draw a DAG. A DAG is a directed acyclic graph that structures um, our knowledge of the influence of the factors on each other and on the observational data. So for example, literary period is up here and we denoted that literary period influences emotion via um, the edge P1. And so this gives us an overview on our factors and um, lets us, um, yeah, gives us the vocabulary to talk about these different influences. Okay, now I will walk you through one example. Uh, imagine we want to measure the influence of gender on emotion. So, uh, yeah, here's gender, and we are interested in this edge and how strong it influences emotion. The first thing we have to take care of are um, possible confounders and Confounders are um, factors that influence both the factor we want to measure and our observations. And this is true for a literary period. As you can see here, it influences gender via P2 and emotion via P1. And if we yeah, just um, can't, if we wouldn't control for it, we kind of um, would add it to gender and this would yeah, lead to errors, predictions. The second thing we have to take care of are mediators. Um, mediators are uh, factors that are influenced by the uh, factor we want to measure and um, also influence the observation. So for example, the gender influences entity via G2 and entity influences emotion via EN1. So now that we have this knowledge, we have to take some action. And this action looks like this. We need to include literary period um, and to exclude all the other factors to actually measure the influence of gender on emotion. Okay, so here you see the results of the uh, more informed model. We repeated this procedure for every factor and um, yeah, measured. Um, and the largest difference between this informed model and the naive model I showed you on the first slide is that the influence of gender here is much larger than with the naive model. And this leads um, to the possible, um, <laughs> yeah, to the uh, hypothesis that a lot of um, influence of gender was uh, kind of um, yeah, um, mediated through these variables and therefore hidden in this naive model and we wouldn't have um, yeah, seen it if we hadn't constructed the, the dark and yeah, adapted our logistic regression. Yeah, but this comes also with a limitation. Merton already mentioned this. Um, our um, selection of uh, features is kind of pragmatic here and by no means uh, complete or something. And in the future, if we add some new um, factors in it, our results might change quite dramatically. Um, 
And yeah, we <laughs> worked on this since um, writing the abstract for this conference. And this led us to a paper at the Conference of Computational Literary Studies that was last month. Um, so if you're more interested <laughs> in uh, this topic, uh, you could give it a read here. So reference, and we are ready for questions. <laughs>